change your plea uh, from not guilty to guilty. Stop for a minor traffic offense by a group of racist police officers. I'm talking to you and you smack me. Bro, nobody smacked you, bro. Why I smack you? You did it? Why I smack you? Answer the questions. Do not volunteer information that is not requested. There was a man named Officer Michael Wagner. He told a fib in his report about a lady named Lizette Gonzalez. He said she was driving all tipsy, but no one ever blew into a breath machine to check. The judge heard about this and got curious. So, there was no more case against Lisette. I want to be enlightened. It was a mistake, admittedly, by Michael Wagner. I know. Testified to that today. He caused her to have her driver's license suspended for, for at least a few months for nothing. Okay. So are you going to null process that case? Um, or am I going to get mad? Perhaps you can get mad at me, Your Honor, but at this point... Why wouldn't you... Um, wait a minute. Did you hear the uncontroverted on? testimony of this officer? Your Honor. Then I want you taking him up on perjury. Your Honor. Will you take him up for he perjury? Did. He admitted it was a mistake, Your Honor. The judge was real mad at the lying cop, and he canceled all the charges against Gonzalez. But he lied. He lied on a sworn Absolutely citation. Absolutely not, Your Honor, and that is, that is not true. I'm dismissing. I'm dismissing. I am, I, I am dismissing. I am dismissing this charge. No, I'm dismissing the charge. This whole and case was fishy, and I have no idea how they. You know what? Address on file. You know what? The state intends to amend I'm granting. The and on I am. I, I'm. I'm. I'm rescinding the sentence. I'm granting the JOA. Because you don't agree with the state's decision. On the I'm granting the charge. JOA in fairness. In fairness, because you, you don't it. like the state's decision today, Your Honor, on the case. No, you. You don't. Are now that right? I consider what Officer Wagner testified to, and how many times. He basically tripped over himself just to arrest this lady with no real probable cause. You're done. Motion JOA is granted. And you're not going to provide a written order on that? Nope. You want to appeal me? Appeal me. Thank you, Your Honor. The case should have never been done. Never. In the end, the truth won, and everyone learned not to tell fibs because it can cause trouble for innocent folks. That's the story of how Lisette Gonzalez got her justice thanks to a judge who cared about the truth. In this particular incident, it appears that an officer pulled over a man's vehicle under the suspicion of alcohol involvement, yet upon closer examination of a video recording, it becomes evident that this assumption might not hold true. What were his responses? And he advised he had several drinks earlier in the night. Okay. Did he give you any time for it? He did not provide a time frame. When you, when you first came up and he was in the driver's seat, did you use a flashlight or anything of that nature to shine in, to look at his face, anything? The video provides compelling evidence that the officer may have attempted to manipulate the situation in his favor when presenting the case to the judge. However, the presiding judge, with a keen and discerning eye, saw through the officer's tactics and recognized the discrepancies in the evidence presented before them. Hold on a second. Did he get him out of the vehicle? I thought I thought the defendant well, he got out of the vehicle he did. in a normal he way. He did. He, he exited the vehicle normally. Yes, sir, he did. On his own without assistance. As if he wasn't intoxicated. Sir? As if he was not intoxicated or as if he was intoxicated. You led me to believe he didn't. Although you smelled alcohol, he exited the vehicle normally as if he was a normal person. Wait, 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 wait. He did actually uh, on his... On his own, okay. without any help. On his own, without Okay. Any... Didn't fall down or anything. No, sir. He did. Okay. This encounter underscores the critical importance of transparency and accountability within the justice system, as well as the need to rely on objective and substantiated evidence when assessing legal matters. In this particular incident, a police officer apprehended an individual despite the fact that the individual had successfully completed all sobriety tests. Surprisingly, during the subsequent court proceedings, the officer justified his actions by claiming that he had a mere suspicion that the individual was not sober. When you saw Mr. Simington get in his car, you saw his car leave, you followed it. I saw a car leave and I saw him driving it. You saw Mr. Simington behind the wheel of a car? Yes. And you followed it? Yes. You radioed to dispatch, quote, I'm going to follow this Mustang. It was the one that appeared to be, I'm not sure what this means, 2301 driving it. What does code 2301 mean? Drunk. And yet you did not stop him when you saw him initially, correct? No. 
despite the fact that you suspected him of being drunk. Right. Aside from the signal violation, just briefly, you did not see any other bad driving? No, I did not. He completed all field sobriety tests with no clues? All that I requested, yes. All indicative of a sober person? He did the field sobriety test correctly, but I still believe he was not sober. No further question. It raises a significant question. Can an arrest be justified solely on the basis of an officer's subjective thoughts without concrete evidence? It is imperative that the judge thoroughly assesses this matter to provide a fair and just resolution. There was a former sheriff named Todd. He found himself in big trouble. He was taken to court for doing some bad things, like driving when he had too much to drink. Todd stood in front of the judge, his face full of worry. The judge kept asking Todd what he did, but Todd didn't want to admit it. At this time, is it your desire to change your plea uh, from not guilty to guilty? Do I have to answer that yes or no, or can I make somewhat of a statement? That's that, is, I... that is a yes or no answer, sir. Will I have the opportunity to say anything further? If you, it is your intention to change your plea from not guilty to guilty, certainly you'll have an opportunity to make any statement. But if it is not your intent to enter a guilty plea at this time, then I'm going to set your case for jury trial, and you're going to stop wasting my time and everybody else's time this afternoon. Ma'am, I'm not trying to waste your time. And then is it your intention to enter a guilty plea at this time or not, sir? No. Mm -hmm. Mr. Why Ch am I wasting your Mr. time? Mr. Chamber. The judge got tired of waiting and moved on to talk to the prosecutor and then decided to take a little break. Every intention of coming in here today and entering a guilty plea. It's difficult for me to enter a guilty plea for a lot of reasons and I don't want this court to think that I am trying to minimize any responsibility that I had in this situation. I feel like I'm being very much bullied into doing something that's not right. And I want this court to know that Todd Pate holds himself responsible for everything that he did. But it's hard for me to lay down and plead to felony charges that don't apply. Is it your intention today to enter this guilty plea? And if I could address... Okay, this is either a yes or no. Are you going to enter your plea or not? I guess everybody thinks it's funny. Let me just plea and get it over with for everybody. Plead to something that I absolutely do not feel good about, but I don't want you to try to send me to the penitentiary for years and years. Probably I think unusual, we're done. At this do point it. in time, I think we're done. Where I think we are today is, is that on the one hand, the Commonwealth can enforce the terms of this agreement based on the execution. Mr. Pate, I'm talking at this point in time. Okay, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. At this point in time, I'm gonna sustain the Commonwealth's motion to revoke his bond. He will be taken into the custody uh, and housed in the Breckenridge County Jail. Your Honor, if I may speak to Mr. Chambers' motion to revoke the bond. Um, I've already ruled. I I've already ruled at this point in time. We we're done at this point in time. And he's going into jail today. Finally, after a long time, Todd gave in. He was sent to jail for 75 days as his punishment. And that's how Todd's story in court ended. Meet Noah Lennon, once a Warren police officer. He's now facing a tough situation. You see, he said sorry for something he did, something pretty bad. As a result of my actions, I caused panic in the community, caused citizens of the African-American community to be targeted and inconvenienced. Let's rewind to January 2020, when it all began. That day, Noah made a false claim about an incident. He told his fellow officers that a man in a dark SUV had hit him can you believe it? Dozens of cops rushed to help him, turning the neighborhood upside down. But here's the twist. It was all a lie. Noah made it up. He said he was sorry, but the damage was done. His actions hurt the Warren City Police Department and the African-American community. This officer who had sworn to uphold and follow the law from someone who made police work his life and would never do anything that would jeopardize not only the, his image, but the image of all officers everywhere. To someone who was so broken that I made a series of bad decisions. In court, Noah spoke up for the first time. He explained that he had some personal problems, but he didn't go into detail. He wished for forgiveness, but some wounds ran deep. 
the black man in a hoodie is a very suspect statement made in today's society right now. And uh, the, cat, the court cat over one. I hope that all those affected can forgive me as I am truly sorry for what I did and what problems it caused. The damage that Mr. Lennon did to the Warren City Police Department and the African American community in Warren City, it, you know, there's nothing that he can do to make up for that. Noah's punishment? Nine months in jail because he couldn't pay $10,000 in reparations to his fellow officers. A tale of bad choices and the consequences that follow. Meet David Oliver, a former police chief of Brimfield Township. He's in a bit of trouble, facing four misdemeanor charges. Unlawful restraint, attempted theft, simple assault, and unauthorized use of property. David got noticed on social media for his plain speaking and funny comments about criminals, which he calls mopes. But his luck turned when the judge called him a mope during sentencing, giving him a taste of his own medicine you become the mope that you wrote about in your book. David resisted, but eventually pleaded no contest to charges like attempted theft while in office and assault. The harassment allegations came from Crystal Casterline, a female officer who accused him of wrongdoing. Crystal, who worked under David, bravely spoke up, saying he harassed her. I guarantee you that Crystal punched me as, as much as I punched her. She wasn't satisfied with the plea agreement, believing it wasn't enough punishment. I was a marathon runner. I loved life. I snuggled my little girls constantly, and I was naive. I was naive. I never understood domestic violence, how it gets that far. Hugs escalated to groping, me, trapping me places, and forcing me into positions where he would press his body into mine, forcing me to dance with him. In the end, David chose to plead guilty to all charges, putting his past behind him. He got two years of probation, had to pay restitution, and was banned from ever being a police officer again. It's a tough lesson for the former chief. Judge Vonda Evans doesn't hold back when passing a sentence to Officer William Melendez. He's been found guilty of beating a suspect during a traffic stop. The suspect was driving a car when the police officer stopped him for a small driving mistake. These police officers, sadly, held some unfair beliefs, and it showed in their actions. Another officer, John Zelenewski, even texted something really mean about it. He asked for satisfaction from knowing the suspect was being hurt, which is just plain wrong. I would have thought this. What crime did I commit? Being a black man in a Cadillac, stopped for a minor traffic offense, by a group of racist police officers, looking to do it. As police officer John Zelenewski, auxiliary police officer, testified in court too, in his response to a text, was quoted as saying, at least give me the satisfaction of knowing that you're out there beating up right now. LOL. How humiliating and degrading that must have been. He was left in a cell for a number of hours before getting medical treatment. But after hearing the defendant and his fellow officers joke about his injuries as it were wiping blood off their uniforms with disinfectant. 2015, please be quiet in my courtroom. How does this happen? I'm going to tell you how it happened. You betrayed your city. You caused your lovely wife heartache. And you caused Mr. Dent severe anguish. And finally, in the words of Vicki Yost, your commander, accountability is required to ensure continued community trust and healing. Imagine how terrible it must have felt for the suspect. He was left in a cell for hours without any medical help. The worst part was hearing the officers joke about his injuries, cleaning their uniforms from his blood. That's not how people should be treated, and Judge Vonda Evans made sure Officer Melendez faced the consequences of his actions. This man had been a cop for more than 20 years, but one day, something bad happened. He heard a nurse at a big hospital. 
the nurse was an older man, 66 years old. It all started when the officer's niece was at the hospital. She was not feeling well in her head. The hospital said she couldn't stay anymore. Her dad, who was the officer's brother, wanted her to stay, but the hospital said no. They told him to make another appointment. So, the officer and his brother talked to the nurse. They went to a quiet place, but things got bad. The officer grabbed the nurse and threw him down hard. Other people saw it on a video. Count one, battery on a person 65 years of age or older, and guilty on one count of false imprisonment. To a point where I was yelling at the top of my lungs, help, help. What happened to me that day should not happen to anybody, especially a healthcare worker. Because of this, the officer lost his job and went to jail for 45 days. After that, he had to do community service and be on probation for three years. There was a 35-year-old police officer named Sean Corder. He worked for the Bloomfield Police Department. Trouble found him as he faced some serious charges. These charges included doing bad things while on duty, messing with official papers, and telling lies under oath. It all began on a day back in 2012 when Sean got a call to go to a man named Marcus Jeter's house. There was a fight between Marcus and his girlfriend. Marcus left willingly, but Sean followed him onto a big road called the Garden State Parkway. Sean stopped Marcus, but Marcus didn't want to get out of his car. He was scared for his safety. More officers came to help, but they crashed into Marcus's car. Amidst all this mess, Sean broke Marcus's car window and, with his buddies, pulled Marcus out. They said Marcus tried to take Sean's weapon and hurt another officer. Marcus was charged with running away, resisting arrest, hurting an officer, and trying to take a cop's weapon. But surprise, new proof showed up and all the charges against Marcus disappeared. This made people start asking questions about what the officers did. A grand jury said the officers did bad things and charged them. Before Sean got his punishment, he talked to the judge at a courthouse. He said he didn't want his family to suffer. My children more than anything in the world. And uh, I know they need me. I don't want them to have to suffer, switch schools, lose friends, lose the house that they're raised in. I haven't been away from my kids for more than a day. And since being incarcerated, I miss Christmas, I miss my little Sabrina's birthday, I miss my Kylie the Rose ride up high school. But Marcus, the guy who'd been through it all, stood up and said Sean had a choice to tell the truth, and he didn't. Rose to say that I resisted. He had a choice. I'm not saying that that messes his character up. I'm not saying that he's not a good guy. I'm just saying that in a situation like this where he has a, an obligation, a moral obligation to tell the truth, he chose not to. In the end, Sean got in big trouble. He was found guilty of doing bad things on the job and messing with records. The judge told him he'd spend five years in prison. In a courtroom, a former police officer named Newman Raja faces the consequences of his actions. He is found guilty of two serious charges. These charges stem from an incident where Raja took the life of Corey Jones, a 31-year-old musician and housing inspector. Corey Jones had been stranded on the side of the road when his car broke down. Friends and family, deeply frustrated and angry about brutality in their community, sent heartfelt messages to Corey. The prosecution presented evidence from August 18, 2015. Around 3.15 a.m., Raja, dressed in plain clothes, approached Corey's car, thinking it was abandoned. Raja claimed Corey aimed a weapon at him, but the prosecution disagreed. They said Raja hit Corey with his weapon when he tried to flee, hitting him six times, leading to the end of Corey's life. This should have never happened. My uncle should still be with us. After careful consideration, the court sentenced Raja to 25 years in prison for each charge to be served concurrently. Count one, I hereby sentence him uh, to 25 years in the Department of Corrections. And on count two, I hereby sentence Mr. Raja to 25 years in the Department of Corrections. This meant he would serve both sentences at the same time, ensuring he spent a collective 25 years behind bars. Justice was served for Corey Jones and his grieving family. Next up, we have Anthony, a man facing questions from the judge. He's suspected of assault. 
a deputy nearby decides to take matters into his own hands, accusing Anthony of false imprisonment and third-degree assault, plus some drug possession. But as Anthony talks to the judge, the deputy's actions catch the judge's eye. They put the deputy in custody before any case against Anthony begins. Investigation for false imprisonment, assault uh, in the third degree, a, a assault as a class two felony, and a misdemeanor uh, charge uh, uh, as well in possession of paraphernalia. I'd like to object first. Uh, you know, if I'm under investigation, I thought the investigation came first, and then the rest came. Go on, man. In the end, Anthony wins a $50,000 civil rights case. There was a man named Stuart Cousins, a former police officer from the Civil Nuclear Constabulary. His life took a dark turn when he was arrested on suspicion of kidnapping. Eventually, he was charged with a grave crime. Stuart Cousins joined the Metropolitan Police in 2018, assigned to the Parliamentary and Diplomatic Protection Section. Surprisingly, he hadn't undergone extra background checks, and he hadn't completed his probationary period. In June 2021, he admitted to his involvement in a serious crime related to a woman named Everard. A month later, he pleaded guilty again. The court sentenced him to life in prison, and his appeal attempt failed. Despite acting alone, Stuart Cousins received a substantial sentence. The court decided he should spend a minimum of 35 years in prison. On the 9th of February 2022, he was sentenced to imprisonment for life with a whole life order. Stuart seeks leave to appeal against sentence. The circumstances of his case do not fall within the terms of the statutory provision which provides that a whole life order should be the normal starting point subject to possible adjustment for the individual facts. It is not one of those rare cases where nonetheless a whole life order should be imposed. We grant leave to appeal and substitute a minimum term of 35 years. This was a significant punishment considering the severity of his actions. In the end, justice prevailed in this story, reminding us that even those in positions of authority can face consequences for their deeds. The police officer arrested someone, and he claims that he read the document to the person before getting him to sign it. However, in reality, he didn't read it to him at all. Now, in front of the judge, the officer openly admits his mistake and acknowledges that he failed to read the document to the arrested individual. At some point, you gave Joel a piece of paper to sign called the implied consent form. Yes, I read it to him and then asked him to make his choices on there and then sign where, whatever his choice was. You never actually read it to him on the night of his arrest, did you? No. You were trained during those 40 hours that you spent at the academy that the chemical test only provides presumptive evidence of alcohol intoxication, correct? Not sure what you mean by presumptive evidence. Well, you were taught how to do field sobriety tests. Yes. What to observe for on the road. Yes. What to observe for on the driver. What to smell for. What to look for. So you don't just stop a driver, suspect him of DUI, and drag him to the station for a test, right? Correct. So you're supposed to look for a lot of factors and then make your conclusion whether or not the individual was under the influence, correct? Correct. Right. The test alone is not enough. It's really that test is made after I've already made my decision. I've already charged the person with DUI before I use the intoxilizer. That's what those tests are for, so I can determine that. There was a man named Marcus Eberhardt. He used to be a police officer responsible for keeping the law in check. But in 2019, something terrible happened. He used a taser during an arrest, and it led to a tragic event involving a man named William Marshall. This event made the news and put Marcus in a big legal fight. Before this happened, Marcus had been a police officer for many years. People knew him for being quite tough. William Marshall, on the other hand, had problems with drugs and had been in trouble with the law before, but he wasn't a violent person. As the trial went on, it became clear that Marcus had used the taser too much, breaking the rules of his police department. The people who said Marcus used too much force were very strong in their arguments. They said Marcus should be held responsible for what happened, but Marcus's side said he was just doing what he was trained to do. They thought William's history of drug use and health problems played a role in what happened. 
In February 2022, a big decision was made. Marcus was found guilty of involuntary misconduct. This was a big deal because it was the first time a police officer in Michigan had been found guilty of using a taser. Marcus had to wait until May 2022 for his punishment. When the verdict came out, Marcus looked like he wanted to leave quickly. His lawyer was sad about the decision, but the worst part was still to come. During his sentencing hearing, the judge said that Marcus deserved a very long punishment. It was a heavy blow for Marcus. Later on, Marcus said he was sorry for what he did. He knew he couldn't change what happened, but he hoped for the family to find comfort in their sorrow. Marcus took full responsibility for his actions and said he was praying for the family to find peace in their hearts. Next up, we have former deputy Joshua Underwood. He's in court for a bond hearing because he got into a standoff. Watch as the story unfolds. I find the solicitor's request for a cash assurance bond of $50,000 to be reasonable accordingly. I'm going to impose that cash or bond uh, for your release. I find it absurd that you haven't even obtained any information from me based on the solicitor. You're going to believe everything he says. Okay. And you're going to go ahead and set a surety bond on me on a misdemeanor. Okay. Are you, are you finished? Okay. If you'll hear me out, please. Thank you. Uh, additionally, I'm going to place a requirement for a GPS monitor prior to your release on bond. Uh, I'm going to restrain or restrict your contact with your domestic partner or the mother of your child, whichever best describes her, to include her place of work and her residence. Additionally, I'm going to prohibit your physical or constructive possession of firearms or ammunition at any time for any reason. And I want to make sure that you understand when I say constructive possession, I mean there's to be no firearms or ammunition in any vehicle you're being transported in or riding in unless what it's... Grounds? What grounds? Are you prohibiting me from firearms? I am. Why? What grounds? I am. Because I have that latitude I given the severity. Firearms? Mr. Underwood. Firearms? Mr. Underwood, in this court, in this court, one person talks at a time. You're going to find yourself in contempt of court. Okay. All right. Are you going to allow me to finish? Construct constructive possession of firearms or ammunition means you will not have it in your possession. It won't be in the house or the room that you're staying in. It won't be in the vehicle that you're being transported in, unless we're talking about transport by law enforcement. Do you understand that? All right, that's all. You're dismissed. Officer, if you'll remove him. Even though the judge stays calm, the deputy doesn't show any respect toward him. In Pike County, Sheriff Charlie Reeder found himself in a tight spot. He'd been taking money from various cases to feed his gambling habit. Picture this. He stands before the judge, ready to spill the beans. The tension fills the room. He starts to confess, and all eyes are on him. Watch closely as the story unfolds. I stand here before you today to take accountability for the, my actions. As a sheriff of Ohio, I shed, <clears throat> excuse me, I shed bad light on the office of sheriff. For this, I am terribly sorry. If I could go back and change it, I would a million times. Here's another box of Kleenex. For this is not who I am. I have and I now pray that the court will find mercy on me. And I beg the court, if they see fit, to grant me community control. The big question uh, I have and is on everyone's mind, I'm assuming, is, I guess, why did you take the money? I took the money. And mind you, this does not excuse it, but from drug dealers that took it from parents of very poor people in this county. You've been in law enforcement for 24 years. We all choose our profession and we have to conduct ourselves with integrity so that everyone uh, trusts us. 
It cannot be underestimated the damage that you have caused to the citizens of Pike County, to law enforcement who every day get up, uh, face the same sort of stresses that you do. They, they go all home at night, uh, they get up in the morning. The sacrifices that these men and women have made, uh, I think you've made a mockery of them. In Oklahoma City, there was a man named Daniel Holtzclaw. He wore a badge and had a job in the police department, but he did something very wrong. He used his power to hurt women. From December 2013 to June 2014, he looked for women who had problems with the law or didn't have much money. When he found them, he did terrible things to them. But one day, he made a big mistake. He stopped a lady named Janie Liggins while driving his police car. He didn't tell anyone about it, Janie wasn't a criminal, and she was brave. She told people what Daniel did to her. The police questioned Daniel for two hours. He said he did nothing wrong, but they didn't believe him. Did your hands go on her at all? I backhanded, I backhanded her on as far as the side. Where on her body? Tell me, you backhanded her. Her waist, her waist, and the back portion. I didn't touch her butt or anything, but the back portion and the waist. And then she lifted it up like right here. They found evidence, like DNA, that linked him to his crimes. Daniel went to trial, and the jury said he was guilty of many crimes. He got a very long sentence, 253 years in prison. Well, was there anything, an accidental touch of anything? If she thought it uh, when I passed her jury, but I, there was nothing as far as, I felt like I would do anything as far as or anything like that. And for my safety, I just checked to see if the weapons are. He's 36 years old now, and will stay in prison for a very long time. His career is over, and he will never be free again. In this distressing tale of abuse of power, a law enforcement officer had demanded access to the images stored on a woman's phone, subsequently exploiting the situation to manipulate and intimidate her. Presently, the officer finds himself standing before a court of justice, where he is being held accountable for his actions ensuring that he faces the appropriate consequences for his reprehensible behavior. When they arrive at the jail, Ms. Kendall testified that he asked her if she had pictures of drugs or nudes on her phone. She said, I don't have pictures of drugs, but I do have personal pictures and videos on my phone. What does he do then? He goes through her phone. He watches the video, he watches the pictures, and immediately after that, what did she say? He asked and he said, I'm going to give you my phone number, and said, if you don't call me, I'm going to add more charges on you. She later found that phone number in her belongings, in the envelope with the ring in it. He charged her for a DUI because she didn't call him as he requested. He followed up on his promise. There was a lady named Amber Geiger. She used to be a police officer in Dallas. Today was a day she had been worrying about, the day when they would tell her if she did something wrong. As they said the verdict, her fears came true. It was even worse than she had thought. The jury unanimously find the defendant, Amber Geiger, guilty of murder as charged in the indictment. No outward. The people in the jury all agreed that Amber Geiger was guilty of a grave crime, just like they said in the papers. Amber took a big breath and tried not to cry. There was a nice officer next to her who patted her head gently. He wanted to make her feel better. On the other side, Botham Jean's family felt happy when they heard the news. They felt like a big weight had been lifted off their shoulders. People had been going to the trial every day, all dressed in red, which was Botham's favorite color. Botham's mom raised her arms up high, like she had won something. But when Amber Geiger left the room where the cameras couldn't see her, she started to cry. Her family looked very surprised and sad too. They didn't know what to do. Now there's going to be another part of the story. They will decide what happens to Amber next. Some people think she should go to a place where she can't go outside for a long time. But her lawyer might try to make it less bad for her. It's a huge victory, not only for the family of both Jean, but as, as his mother, Allison, told me a moment ago, this is a, a victory for black people in America. This story is important because it's not usual for a police officer to get in trouble like this, especially in a situation where people are worried about race. It's a big win for Botham Jean's family. Meet Zachary Wester, a former sheriff's deputy in Jackson County, Florida. At first glance, he seems like a dedicated law officer, but beneath his uniform and badge lies a dark side. 
He craves power and misuses his authority for personal gain. Instead of protecting the community, he secretly plants drugs on innocent people during routine traffic stops. His twisted journey began in 2016 when he got addicted to the authority he wielded. It did return presumptive positive for methamphetamine, okay? I'm just letting you know. He cunningly hides narcotics in his hand and discreetly plants them on unsuspecting motorists. This deceit goes on for years until a driver reports his misconduct, leading to an investigation that exposes his web of lies. In 2019, Wester was arrested and found guilty on numerous charges, including racketeering and perjury. His actions shattered the trust people had in law enforcement. During his trial, he denies wrongdoing, but the overwhelming evidence seals his fate. In the courtroom, he appears arrogant and unremorseful, while victims share how his actions affected their lives. Being a mother and a grandmother for the last three years, I've probably missed a year and a half of my grandbaby's life because of this. The defendant made choices to violate that trust and commit crimes against the very citizens that he had sworn to protect. Why were you turning your body camera off there? It was customary and per policy to turn off any recording devices. In September 2021, justice prevails as Wester is sentenced to 12 years in prison and hit with hefty fines. His story serves as a stark reminder of the importance of trust and integrity in law enforcement. In an unfortunate turn of events, this particular law enforcement officer took it upon himself to apprehend a lady, despite lacking any concrete evidence against her. To compound matters further, the alleged offense for which he detained her was a mere speeding violation. I would write down everything that I needed to write down to conclude my investigation. As we noticed in the video, her speech was not slurred, correct? You can't depict it from the video very well. So you're saying the video was inaccurate? No, I'm not saying the video was inaccurate. I'm just saying that when you're standing a distance from somebody, it's, it's not like as you're actually standing there. In your citation, you did not note that she had red bloodshot eyes, correct? Yes, I did not indicate it. Which is a typical indicator of impairment, correct? It's, it's an indicator, yes. It was a grievous misstep in the officer's judgment, and it seemed as though he had acted rashly and without due diligence. However, justice has a curious way of catching up to those who transgress its boundaries. In a twist of fate, the judge presiding over this case found it within their power to ensure that the officer faced the consequences of his actions. You did not note in your citation that her eyes were glassy, correct? Correct. Nor did you note that her face was flushed? Correct. You did not note in your citation that there was a smell of alcohol? Mm, nope, I did not note it in my citation. The judge recognized the grave injustice inflicted upon the innocent lady who had been falsely arrested and resolved to make the officer meet his karmic reckoning. A former Edison police officer named Michael Dotro stood before a judge in court. He had been arrested for a serious crime, but we won't talk about that. The judge looked at Mr. Dotro sternly. You see, Mr. Dotro's actions over the years from 1998 to this year were very, very bad. They were the worst things someone in our society could do. So, the honest judge decided to give him a punishment. I also want everyone to understand where I'm coming from with regards to this, especially if there's going to be any appellate review of this sentence. I want those judges to know the sentence to be imposed in this particular case is because Mr. Dotro, through his conduct and his admissions, spanning 1998 to this year represents the worst that we can possibly expect from someone in our society. Yes, he's caused very specific damage to Captain Anderpo and his family, to Ms. Zog, to Ms. Dotro, to his own parents, to his families, to his brothers. But what he's really done and what we're going to be left with after he's walking out the door to spend the next third of his life in prison is allow people a basis to say that our system of justice has no integrity. How could it when we've allowed this particular individual like him here in Middlesex County 
here in Edison to do the things that he's done. Similar to what we see on the news every day from other parts of the country. Because of what this individual has done, because of him and people like him, victims are afraid to come forward to be part of the criminal justice system and get the relief that they're entitled to from being victimized because they have no faith in it, because they don't know who to trust. Even more importantly, we have other individuals every day who put on a badge, a badge which represents honor, service, and integrity. Without question, go out there every day, leave their family behind to protect an entire community with hopes that they can make it through the day, through the end of their shift, so that they can go back home to their family and lead a normal human being life. Because the life of a police officer is not a normal human being life. He sentenced the former officer to 20 years in prison. And that's how the story ends, with justice being served. In this scenario, a not-so-vigilant police officer had apprehended an individual, but regrettably omitted crucial specifics from the citation. The astute lawyer, armed with a wealth of legal knowledge and a determination to uphold justice. It was a positive fact, not helping your investigation. You did not feel the need to include it in your citation. You testified that Mr. Klein's speech was slow and slurred. Do you remember that? That's correct. Could you please point to the line in your citation where that is listed on your citation? I don't see it listed in the post arrest complaint. Another point that you testified to on direct examination was that Mr. Klein was unsteady on his feet, end quote. Do you remember that? I do. Could you please point to the line in your citation where that is listed? That's not in there. You indicated on direct examination that you have completed that in this case as well, correct? I did ask him that question. Could you please point to the citation where that phrase is listed or which line? That's not in there because he was able to do a balance test. So because it was a positive fact, not helping your investigation, you did not feel the need to include it in your citation? I didn't see the need to do that. Meet Eric de Valcanera, a former police detective who found himself in the middle of a crisis. In 2019, he was given a six-year sentence for a tragic incident involving the loss of Cameron Lamb's life. The whole story began during a traffic problem in Kansas City. Eric, along with his partner, was dressed in regular clothes and police vests when they entered Lamb's backyard without a proper warrant. As things got chaotic, Lamb slowly backed his truck into the garage and Eric fired four shots, believing he saw a weapon. This split-second choice changed their lives forever, ending Lamb's life. The trial that followed was emotional, as Eric recounted the events of that unfortunate day, shedding tears that showed the weight of the tragedy. Ultimately, Eric was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter and armed criminal action. He got a three-year and a six-year sentence to be served together. However, he was released during the appeals process, causing shock among many. The grieving Lamb family found some closure, but the pain of loss remains. They hope this case can lead to changes in the Kansas City Police Department, addressing issues of police brutality and racial profiling that continue to affect Americans disproportionately. Many people debate Eric's justification for using deadly force, suggesting that alternative methods should have been tried since Lamb posed no immediate threat. The incident highlights the ongoing issue of systemic racism within law enforcement. In Fort Worth, there was a man named John Romer. He used to be a police officer, but things took a bad turn for him. You see, a few years back in 2019, he got into trouble for not telling the truth in front of a big jury. It all started in a hospital lobby in 2016 when he had a fight with another guy. Security cameras recorded everything and it showed that John did something wrong. He was supposed to protect people, but he ended up hurting someone. Fast forward to 2019, and he had to face the consequences. It is therefore the order judgment decree of this court that the defendant, John Preston Romer Jr., is hereby sentenced to five years confinement in the institutional division of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice. They said he lied on purpose, and that's called perjury. Instead of helping folks, he was now in big trouble himself been a more severe, aggravated perjury. All the lies that he told to cover up his excessive... Romer told him 
If I let you go after having to throw you on the ground and hit you, then I'm in trouble. He didn't have to throw him on the ground and hit him. But he committed to a lie on that day. And we're here four and a half years later, still dealing with it. It has no bones. It has a case that has no substance. It's a case that has no materiality. The statement, you're under arrest, is not material to anything that was litigated in this courtroom. It's a complete jellyfish of a case. The judge decided he should spend five years in prison for what he did. It could have been even worse. Up to 10 years, but he got five. So, John Romer, the former police officer, went from being a cop to being a prisoner. That's how his story changed forever. There was a man named Derek Stafford. He was 33 years old, and one day, something very tragic happened. It was back in 2015 when Derek, who used to be a deputy marshal, was involved in a terrible incident. He was chasing a car driven by a man named Chris, and there was a little six-year-old boy named Jeremy in the car with his dad. Derek, along with his colleague, tried to make Chris stop his car, but things went terribly wrong. Derek ended up firing his weapon into the car, not realizing that Jeremy was inside. Jeremy's dad had his hands up, but it was too late. Derek was later found guilty of taking the boy's life and faced a long time in jail. Some people were happy with this decision, while others thought it was unfair. Derek's aunt even called it modern day slavery, but others believed it was about justice and not race. Meanwhile, there was another case involving a man named Roy Oliver. He was a police officer who did something very wrong. He hit the boy named Jordan, who was unarmed and in a car. Taking Jordan's life was senseless, and Roy was fired and charged with the grave crime. His trial took some time, and eventually, he was convicted and sentenced to 15 years in prison. Trying to seriously injure or kill the driver of that car? I was trying to stop the threat inside the vehicle, correct. His lawyers tried to challenge the decision, but it didn't work. These cases were indeed crazy, but they show how justice can sometimes be difficult to achieve and the pain of losing loved ones is immeasurable. Meet Eric DeVolcaner, a former police officer from Kansas City. He faced the consequences of a tragic event that occurred in 2019. On that fateful day, an innocent man was backing his pickup truck into his own garage. Eric DeVolcaner and his partner, responding to a traffic incident with a red pickup truck, approached the scene without a legal warrant. They were dressed in plain clothes with police vests and weapons drawn. As they arrived, they found the victim slowly backing his truck into the basement garage. Commands were given, but it's unclear if he heard them. Believing he saw a weapon, Eric fired four shots, leading to a tragic outcome. As a result, Eric received a verdict of three years in prison for involuntary manslaughter and an additional six years for armed criminal actions. In this compelling video clip from the courtroom, observe a law enforcement officer openly acknowledging his actions of deliberately destroying crucial evidence that he had discovered. Alcohol that you found in the Wendy's cup, you found it after you had placed Mr. Dotson in handcuffs. That's correct. You sniffed the contents and determined it to be alcohol. It had the odor of an alcoholic beverage. Did you bring it with you to court today? No. Did you preserve it in the evidence locker at the Richmond Police Department? No, I poured it out. Are you admitting to this jury that you committed the offense of destruction of evidence? I did pour out the liquid that was in the cup. I, I had no plans on collecting it. It's not our common procedure or policy that we do collect those. I smelled what I believed to be the odor of alcoholic beverage and based on Mr. Dotson's statements as well, and I poured it out, yes sir. Are you aware that destruction of evidence is a class D felony in Kentucky, carrying up to five years in prison and a $10,000 fine? Yes sir. He offers this confession while under oath shedding light on a significant breach of trust 
and a potentially grave miscarriage of justice within the legal proceedings. This is Matthew Dages, a former La Mesa police officer facing a hotly debated arrest video. The question of whether he will face charges for making up a police report hangs in the balance. The preliminary examination of Dages recently ended, stemming from the incident that caused days of protests. He's accused of knowingly presenting a fake police report. In the courtroom, there's a clear divide between those supporting the officer, convinced the case lacks merit, and those supporting Amari Johnson, claiming the charges against Dages fall short. Dages looks composed in a suit as Detective Julie Jensen testifies about the encounter. Mr. Johnson swatted at his hand or pushed his hand. The incident began with suspicion of smoking and escalated quickly, leading to Dages facing a felony charge for a fabricated report. This report is that uh, he thought he was smoking. He didn't think he was smoking because he had no cigarettes, he had no lighter, he didn't even raise a lit object to his lips. This is a lie. I'm talking to you and you smack me. Bro, nobody smacked you, bro. Why I smack you? You didn't? Why I smack you? You didn't? Why you, didn't? Smack you? you didn't hit my arm? Why I smack you? Local activists rally in support of Johnson, intensifying the situation. Days after this George Floyd incident, it's very volatile. I mean, our society, they want to demonize police officers. It's time that we stand up and, and support our police officers. For some, it's political, with tensions rising after George Floyd's tragic passing away, as Dages now faces possible prison time. It's March 2023, and we're at the sentencing hearing of a police officer named Michael Amiot. He was convicted in July 2022 due to an incident from August 2017. The judge decides on a 90-day sentence, a $1,000 fine, and court costs but then suspends the sentence for one year on non-reporting community control. The court at this time will impose a sentence of uh, 90 days, uh, require you to pay a fine of $1,000, and will require you to pay the court costs. In addition, the court will suspend the sentence of 90 days uh, place you on non-reporting community control for a period of one year. Uh, if you violate during that one year, then the court will retain the ability to impose the sentence. The judge feels that Mr. Hubbard's rights were violated by Officer Amiot, but due to the time that has passed, assault charges are used instead of civil rights violations. While, uh, Mr. Hubbard's rights were violated and the officer, as an officer, he used his authority to do that. However, given the length of time involved here, the court will use the assault as opposed to the violation of civil rights. I, I'm, I'm still troubled by the fact that you did not address Mr. Hubbard. I, I can address him. Oh, no, that's all right, Your Honor. No, no it's, it's not all right. I don't need you. You do need him. The judge advises Mr. Hubbard to move on and not let the incident control him. I'm telling you, you need to move on. Not easy. Life is not easy. But as long as you let that handicap you. He has control. Officer Amiot's case had been delayed for two years after his arrest in August 2019. This is Tina Gonzalez, a correction officer at Fresno County Sheriff's Office. She had inappropriate relationships with inmates. One day, the jail staff received a tip about an inmate having a cell phone and being involved with Tina. They searched the cell and found the phone, confirming the relationship. Tina faced serious charges for her actions. She resigned, but it already caused a lot of trouble. Assistant Sheriff Steve McComas expressed his disgust, saying it was one of the worst things he'd seen in 26 years. It's to make it easier to have sex with an inmate and having intercourse in full view of 11 other inmates is something only a depraved mind. Tina not only got involved with inmates, but also put others in danger. She gave the inmate a cell phone, razors, drugs, and secret information. 
communicated sensitive information to the inmate about individuals that were entering the inmate's pod, as well as times and places or at times when the pod would be started. This was risky. Even after getting caught, Tina continued her relationship and didn't own up to her mistakes. She continually calls, has sexually explicit conversations with the inmate in question, and even most about the crime she carried out shows that she's incapable of owning up to her mistakes and will undoubtedly continue in the future. During the court case, she remained silent, but the judge was somewhat lenient due to her clean record. I believe that people can redeem themselves. You got the rest of your life to prove it. The judge criticized her actions, but believed in redemption. Tina got a 210-day prison sentence. In San Luis Obispo, California, there was a courtroom filled with tension. Two lawyers were in the midst of a heated exchange, even though the court was on a break. On one side was Timothy McGill, representing a client who believed they were wrongly fired from a state hospital job. On the other side sat Deputy Attorney General Jenny Mariah Kelly, the state's second highest legal officer. During the trial, McGill asked a question to challenge a witness's credibility. He wondered if the witness had met Kelly earlier that day. This made Kelly very upset, and she gestured angrily, raising her voice. A bailiff named Tyler Brooks stepped in, asking Kelly to calm down and leave the courtroom, but Kelly refused to comply. Things took an unexpected turn as the bailiff tried to escort her out. They ended up struggling on the floor. More deputies arrived to help, and eventually they handcuffed Kelly. She was charged with resisting a peace officer, but later pleaded no contest to disturbing the peace. As part of her sentence, she had to pay a fine and attend anger management classes. And that's how this courtroom drama unfolded. Observe the police officer as she stands in the solemn court, engaged in a passionate and heated argument with the presiding judge. Her fervent words fill the room as she vehemently expresses her viewpoint, unyielding in her stance. However, the judge, a seasoned arbiter of justice, remains resolute and composed, refusing to be swayed by the officer's impassioned pleas. Some people were um, swearing. Absolutely. And would you describe other people's demeanors as upset or angry? Um, it's, it's, I, I don't know if you've seen anybody be killed, but it's upsetting. Um, the answer is yes, I was just going to object, Your Honor. As argumentative and you can proceed. We are outside the hearing of the jury, Ms. Hansen. I'm advising you do not argue with counsel and specifically do not argue with the court. Is I, the camera off? Are the cameras off? No, they are not. We are on the record. Okay. You will not argue with the court. You will not argue with counsel. Mm -hmm. They have the right to ask questions. Your job is to answer them. I was finishing my answer. I will determine when your answer is done. Okay, well. And so, do not argue with the court. Do not argue with mm -hmm. counsel. Answer the questions. Do not volunteer information that is not requested. The attorneys for the state have redirect. They can ask you questions if they think that certain things were left out. Okay. It is counsel's prerogative to ask you leading questions and for you to answer those and not volunteer additional information. Okay. Are we clear on this? We're clear. Thank you. Come back tomorrow at 9.30. With wisdom and authority, the judge proceeds to impart a valuable lesson, not only to the officer, but to all those present in the courtroom, reminding everyone of the importance of justice, fairness, and the rule of law. In 2015, there was a man named Daniel Holtzclaw, who used to be a police officer in Oklahoma City. He faced many serious charges, like hurting people and doing bad things to them. These charges include hurting women, touching them when they don't want it, and doing other bad stuff. Holtzclaw did these things to African-American women between 2013 and 2014. He chose his victims from a part of the city on the basis of skin color. He did this by checking if they had done something wrong before or had problems with the law. Even though people said he did these things, Holtzclaw was still a police officer getting paid until he was officially charged in 2014. Mr. Holtzclaw, this jury finds you guilty of the various uh, counts. You will be remanded to the custody of the Oklahoma County Sheriff for formal sentencing set January 21st, 2016 at 10 o'clock a.m. He lost his job in 2015. 
in November 2015, he went to court. Holtzclaw said he didn't do anything wrong, but the jury said he did and gave him a big jail sentence. Holtzclaw's lawyer wanted another trial, but the judge said no. Former police officer Eric Fritz, seen here with his lawyer in July 2016, pulled over a car one day. He arrested the driver and then took a woman named Melissa McMillan to a hotel where he did some bad things to her on three separate occasions. A judge told him he could go to jail for 15 years. Melissa told everyone about the bad things Eric did to her when she was very drunk. She said her life changed forever, and her family and friends had to see her suffer because of him. She's really scared when she sees police cars now. Melissa felt sorry for drinking too much that night. She didn't even remember leaving the bar. I knew I was highly intoxicated, yet you used that as a selfish opportunity. My life has been forever changed. Every aspect of my life has been affected. My children have struggled. My friends, family, and loved ones have watched me through a year of hell. I can't see a police vehicle without feeling fear or be reminded of what happened. I made a poor decision to have too many drinks, putting myself in a vulnerable position. Eric said he was sorry for taking her to the hotel, but he didn't talk about the other bad things he did. Mr. Fritz, anything you wish to tell me? Yes, Your Honor. First, I'd like to apologize to my friends and family who I've actually let down. I'd also like to apologize for my co-workers who I embarrassed by my decisions. Um, I'd also like to apologize to the people who are working on the for my actions that night. And I absolutely would like to apologize for Ms. McMillan for my horrific decision of offering her a hotel room. I never should offer her a hotel room in the first place. It never should have. I never should put her in that situation. The judge reminded Eric that he promised to protect people, but he hurt a helpless woman. She said he used his badge to do bad things. He took a law enforcement oath of honor to protect and to serve and to uphold the highest of ethical standards. Instead, he preyed upon and exploited and damaged a woman, a woman who was entirely helpless due to excessive intoxication. Even more disturbing to this court is the fact that you use your badge and the authority and power it grants you as a means to implement your criminality. You betrayed her, you betrayed your fellow officers, you betrayed them mightily, the public trust all of us can. In the end, Eric went to jail for a year and had probation for five years. Melissa got more than $100,000 because of what happened. There was a lady named Joyce Mitchell. She worked at a prison in upstate New York. Something strange happened one day. Joyce helped two prisoners, David Sweat and Richard Matt, to escape from the prison. It was like a movie called The Shawshank Redemption. Joyce gave them tools like chisels and hacksaw blades. She hid them inside frozen hamburger meat. A guard unknowingly gave the meat to the prisoners. She also gave Richard Matt six hacksaw blades. People in the prison saw Joyce spending a lot of time with the two men. Joyce said she helped them because they threatened her family. You did wrong. I deserve to be punished. But, you know, people need to know that I was only trying to save my family. But the judge didn't believe her. With the tools Joyce gave them, the prisoners cut through their cells and a brick wall. They also crawled through a steam pipe. Then, they came out of a manhole. They left clothes and a note in their beds to trick the guards. Oh, if they are still in the immediate area or if they are in uh, Mexico. Joyce was supposed to meet them in a car, but she didn't come. She said she had a panic attack and went to the hospital. This messed up their plan. The prisoners ran away and the police searched for them. After three weeks, they caught David at the Canadian border, but Richard was no more. I just don't find that explanation credible. Your husband's life would not have been more in danger by exposing the plot to escape. Joyce went to court and got a prison sentence of two and a third to seven years. While you express remorse for the harm you caused the community, you also stated that you believe the negotiated sentence is too harsh. 
taking into consideration all the various sentencing factors, I can assure you, you have nothing to complain about with the negotiated sentence. For the reasons stated, I will approve the sentence and proceed as follows. She also had to pay a fine of $5,000. The judge didn't think she was sorry for what she did. Joyce cried as she heard her punishment. There was a man named Daniel Saylor. He used to be the chief of police in Windermere, Florida. But his life took a big turn one day. Daniel had started as a patrol officer in Ohio, and he worked really hard to become a police chief in different towns. He served for many years, always dedicated to his job. But then, something bad happened. In 2014, there was a problem with a rich person's house in Windermere. They said the house was built too big. Daniel had to talk in a special way about it in a room where people asked questions. They thought he lied in that room, so they said he did something wrong. In 2019, there was a big meeting in a special room, and Daniel got in trouble. They said he lied, and that was not good. They said he had to go to a place where people can't leave for eight years. Daniel looked really sad and asked for help to leave that room. He said sorry for losing his job and hurting his name. He tried to tell the people who decided that he didn't do anything bad, but they didn't listen. He said sorry to his family too, especially his wife. Even though he knew he wasn't perfect, he still thought the way he got in trouble was not right. He said some people did bad things to make him look bad. In June 2012, a man named Marcus Jeter found himself in a tough situation. He got into trouble when he was accused of grabbing a police officer's weapon, running away, and not cooperating with the police. Two officers, Sean Carter and Orlando Trinidad, even wrote down false stories about what happened during Jeter's arrest. These lies could have sent Jeter to prison for five long years, but luckily, there was a dash cam recording of the incident. It showed that Jeter had raised his hands in surrender after the officers broke his car window and pulled him out. In court, Officer Sean Carter pleaded for a lighter sentence, explaining how he missed his family and didn't want them to suffer. I love my children more than anything in the world. And uh, I know they need me. I don't want them to have to suffer, switch schools, lose friends, lose the house that they are raised in. I don't want them to become emotionally scarred from me being alive. And I'm uh, sorry. I, a lot of that stuff I had to hurt from my wife, and it, it kind of hit me. Uh, I haven't been away from my kids for more than a day. And since being incarcerated, I miss Christmas, I miss my little Sabrina's birthday, I miss my Kylie the Rose ride at high school, which I was practicing with her. And I also missed a lot of uh, Boy Scout events for my son Connor. I love my kids and my family, Your Honor, and if you could please impose the least possible sentence so I can get back to supporting and raising my family. Jeter reminded him of the importance of telling the truth especially as an officer sworn to uphold justice. Man of the law is an oath that, that they take, and it's to tell the truth. And in this situation, there was time given for Mr. Corder to tell the truth. He chose to say that I jumped out the back window. He chose to say that I pulled off on him. He chose to say that I resisted. He had a choice. I'm not saying that that messes his character up. I'm not saying that he's not a good guy. I'm just saying that in a situation like this where he has a, an obligation, a moral obligation to tell the truth, he chose not to. In the end, both officers were sentenced to five years in prison without parole, teaching us that dishonesty can come back to haunt you. Hold on to our final clip, which is the most scariest and most creepiest one. And if you like what you saw, make sure you subscribe and hit the notification bell so you never miss out on our creepiest videos. In a courtroom, a judge addresses everyone, saying that the jury has made a decision in the case against a former police officer, Aaron Dean. The jury took about 13 hours to reach this verdict. As they enter the courtroom, they confirm their decision. The judge then reads their statement, declaring Aaron Dean guilty of manslaughter beyond a reasonable doubt. Tatiana Jefferson, 
who was playing video games with her eight-year-old nephew when the incident occurred, is the victim. The jury sentenced Aaron Dean to 11 years, 10 months, and 12 days in prison. The judge asks each juror individually if this is indeed their verdict, and they all confirm. Verdict reads, we the jury, having found the defendant Aaron York Dean guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of the offense of manslaughter, assess his punishment and confinement in the Texas Department of Criminal Justice for 11 years, 10 months, 12 days. They do not assess a fine, and it is signed by the presiding juror. You may be seated. Thank you very much. Juror number one, is this your verdict? Yes, Your Honor. Juror number three, is this your verdict? Yes, Your Honor. Juror number four, is this your verdict? Yes, Your Honor. Juror number six, is this your verdict? Aaron Dean is informed that he will be transferred to the Texas Department of Criminal Justice to serve his sentence. He will receive credit for the time spent in custody from his arrest until today. The judge also mentions Dean's right to appeal the jury's decision. It's the jury having found you guilty of the offense of manslaughter and assessed this punishment. It's the order of the court you be remanded to the custody of the sheriff be delivered to the director of the Texas Department of Criminal Justice to serve your sentence as required by law, you will receive credit for all the time that you have served in custody on this case from the date of your original arrest up until today, which would be the date of sentence. You have the right to appeal the jury's decision to do so by giving written notice of appeal to the Second Court of Appeals here in Fort Worth within 30 days. During the trial, Dean claimed self-defense, believing he was responding to a burglary. The jury rejected a grave crime charge, which could have led to a life sentence. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the notification bell so you can stay updated with our latest videos.